Congressman Jerry Litton believes that a democracy depends on informed people. He also believes our government should be more open and accessible to the people. To better inform you of what is happening in your government, Missouri's 6th District Congressman Jerry Litton invites Washington personalities to come to Missouri each month and join him in an unrehearsed, question and answer, open to the public town meeting to discuss key issues facing our nation. Dialogue with Lytton brings you closer to your government and Washington closer to you. our candidacy and filed formally and went to St. Louis. But it's been an exciting 10 days. Uh, our uh, consultants in the campaign said it would take four or five days before the people became aware of the fact that we were there and uh, they knew exactly what they were telling us. Because the first day as we went from door to door and store to store and street to street and shook hands with people, <clears throat> after I shook hands with them and told them who I was as I walked away, they'd already forgotten it. And uh, they weren't really sure where I, whether I was there as a labor socialist party or I was selling a new form of religion uh, or fraternity rings or opening a new discotheque. And then the second and third day, uh, people were starting to say, I've seen you somewhere. Um, of course, they've seen a box of cornflakes too, you know. They, they, <laughs> they weren't really sure where they'd seen us. They, they knew they'd seen us somewhere. Maybe, maybe it was out the zoo last Saturday. And, uh, then the, the fourth and fifth day, uh, it started to break, and uh, it was very exciting to see the change in the city. Uh, the fifth and sixth day, as my wife and I went into the stores and walked the streets, uh, it was, hi, Jerry, and you walk into a, uh, to a jewelry store, and the jeweler throws up his glasses and looks at the door and says, Jerry, come on in. We're for you. We like what you have to say. And the um, cab driver stopping on the corner and waving out the window, uh, hi, Jerry, we're for you. Uh, keep, keep going at it, give, them, give it to them, Jerry. And that's the city of St. Louis, and uh, they opened their hearts to us and opened their arms to us, and, and it's been very, very exciting. We start our day, 4.30 in the morning at Plant Gates, and uh, after you shake uh, 1,500 to 2,000 hands, and that's no big job for me, I've been milking cows, you know. And, <laughs> but, um, <laughs> it's about the same, only it's a whole lot easier, you just got one at a time, you know. <laughs> And then from there, from uh, about 5.30 or 6 to 8 o'clock, it's the pancake houses and the restaurants and the bus stops and the truck stops. And, uh, you know, we really got them on those bus stops. We get, a hold of a, get ahead of a bus. And you stop at the bus stop, and everybody's standing there with nothing to do. And we stop the car, and we're shaking the hands and visiting with them. As we drive away from the bus stop, there's 16 people standing there reading your literature. You know, they have nothing else. <laughs> We've got a captive audience. And then from uh, about 8 in the morning until late afternoon, it's uh, high schools and colleges and civic clubs and meetings. And, and uh, my wife and I and some volunteers try to knock on uh, between 700 doors and 1,000 doors uh, sometime during a two-hour period that day and selected townships and households throughout the, the St. Louis area. And then we wrap up the day from 10 to 11.30 at night uh, in the bowling alleys and from 11.30 to 1 a.m. at the truck stops. Now. Uh, if any of you folks would like to get acquainted with St. Louis. Uh, quickly, let me know and go with me to St. Louis and we'll get acquainted with St. Louis. But I just wanted you to know, it's great, it looks exciting. Uh, the people uh, are just like the people here in Kansas City. They're just like the people in Moberly and Marshall and Chillicothe and Tarkio and Savannah. They're, they're kind, they're, they're warm, they're hospitable, they're courteous. Uh, they're no different. Those who've said, well, St. Louis is different. Uh, they're wrong. They're kind people. They're just like the people are here. They're concerned about government. They're concerned about the economy. They're concerned about peace. They're concerned about food. They have the same concerns, the same interests. They want good government. They want responsive government. And uh, we're very excited. We, we think things are really happening in St. Louis. Well, things are going to happen here today because we have a very exciting guest. Our guest today was the first man in Illinois to serve as lieutenant governor 
with a governor of a different party. He was elected to that post in 1968. And then in 1972, he was endorsed by every major newspaper in Illinois for his bid for governor. And a change of two votes for precinct would have made him governor of Illinois. In 1972, he ran for the United States Congress in Illinois and won that seat with a larger vote than any of the entire Illinois delegation, including all the incumbents, which would indicate the great following and support he has in his own state. Uh, now, of course, uh, in addition to being one of the most effective members of the United States Congress, he's also the uh, unofficial leader, I guess you would say it, uh, of the effort nationwide to gain uncommitted delegate votes for Hubert Humphrey for the nomination for president. He's a friend of mine. He is a distinguished uh, legislator and member of the United States Congress, highly regarded by his colleagues, and I might add, by me. Let's welcome Paul Simon from Illinois. <laughs> Jerry, I, I have heard all about this from Jerry and from Senator Humphrey and from Shirley Chisholm and Tip O'Neill and I don't know who all, but uh, it's it's always good to be here in person and see what this is uh, what this is like. I think you're you you're doing a great public service in doing this. Too often, you know, we whether we're Democrats or Republicans, we go to these rallies and we say, you know, we're all good and they're all bad, and people think that's a the dialogue of democracy, but this is the dialogue of democracy, this kind of thing, and I, I think it's great. In addition, <laughs> uh, anyone ask me, I'll sure tell them that, that Jerry Litton is an imaginative, creative, responsible member of the United States Congress, and uh, I'd be proud of Jerry Litton if I were in the Paul, we have microphones stationed around the room. We never know what questions might be asked. We hold our breath and hope they're not the kind that we can't answer. You're surrounded. You can't get too controversial here now, can no, you, Jerry? No, not really. No, these chairs turn around. Sometimes you can turn your back on a tough question if you pass it out. <laughs> <laughs> We'd like to ask that you come to the microphones, pose your question as you would, give your name and your town, and, and we'll try our best uh, to respond to them. It usually takes about uh, 15, 20 seconds for anybody to get up enough nerve to go to the microphone. But uh, once they've gotten the nerve, um, I could mention one thing that that will evoke a few questions right off. I'm a member of the post office committee, among other <laughs> things. <laughs> uh, I've tried to keep that a secret. Oh, though, yeah. you know that. <laughs> Question here. My main concern is in relationship to the total dollar output for our military complex, as compared to total dollar output for education. And there is a, uh, a very big gap between the two. I'd like to know how would you propose, uh, Congressman Simon, that we uh, come about with some type of system to equate or to elevate our educational system so that they can be improved uh, as far as teacher ratio and as far as improving our total educational systems themselves. I personally tend to think we are excessively reliant on the real estate tax uh, in the nation generally. That uh, what we do by doing that is we, we deprive poor areas and secondly, we discourage responsible citizenship. If you add a room onto your home and you fix up your home, the assessor comes around and says you're a fine citizen, we're proud of you, and we're gonna increase your taxes. <laughs> And I don't, I, I happen to think that's one of the, one of the reasons, uh, I think that's one of the reasons we have uh, slums in our inner cities is that we have rewarded people for not keeping up their property. And I don't think that's a, that's a wise thing to do. Then the third thing you touch upon, and that is our defense expenditures over against education. I think in fairness, you have to match the total education effort in state government and local government also, and then it goes way above the defense expenditure. I wish we didn't have to spend a dime on defense, but we're not living in that kind of a world. I think that we worry about hunger and feeding people and peace and a strong military. And I think if we realize that if our people were better educated, there would be a greater likelihood of peace 
There would be more food produced. There would be more products manufactured. All of the things that we want, uh, we would have more of. Uh, we spend about as, as a modern world, the, the major nations of the world are spending about $12,000 to arm each man. And they're spending about $233 to educate each child. So there's a disproportionate amount of money spent to arm a man and to educate a child. You touched on the best part, and that is real estate tax. One of the reasons why our education is such that we are 15th in the, in the world in literacy, 15th. 14 countries have a higher literacy rate than we do. It's because we've relied on property tax to support our schools. And the people just are not going to pay any more property tax because it's an inequitable tax and it hasn't been fair since we quit making our own shoes. And uh, the, the people object to it. A woman on Social Security making $3,200 a year, living in a $15,000 home, is paying the same tax as a man across the street making $40,000 a year in a $15,000 home. She's paying too much. She can't pay her utility bills now. She votes against a school bond. She ought to. Uh, and, and he ought to pay more and wants to. That's why he's out knocking on doors for the school bond issue. And then we have a young man. We want to get him started in farming. We want to get him in business. So they go out and they borrow $170,000 for a farm or a business, put up $30,000, and the appraiser comes along at the end of the year, says you're worth $200,000. He's not worth $200,000, he's worth thirty. dollars uh, The banker, somebody else has the one hundred and seventy, dollars but he doesn't. And yet he's taxed as if he did. And the real inequity is that the farmer businessman down the road that owns his farmer business is worth seven times as much, making three or four times as much income, probably paying half as much tax because his appraisal was based on an appraisal set 10 years ago, and the young businessman or farmer's appraisal was set six months ago when he bought the farmer business. It's just not fair. Plus the inequities of the, you know, of the... Question here. What's your point of view on the issue of a health, national health insurance program? Oh, that's a tough one. You, you want a one-minute answer? <laughs> <laughs> well, my own feeling is that we have to do a better job, but that we have to be realistic about the financing of it, and it has to be a step-by-step -step thing. And at some point where we see it is not wise, then we can we can pull back, we can modify. An immediate step that I think that we ought to be taking, uh, that, uh, or two immediate steps, one is for our senior citizens. Right now, they are 10% of our population. They pay 28% of the medical bills. That's hospital, doctors, drugs, and so forth. Uh, we ought to be saying to the senior citizens, we're gonna be, we will pay, for example, for dentures, for hearing aids for eyeglasses. Something's wrong if we can get a man to the moon, but we can't get dentures to people who build our communities. Uh, we, um, we secondly, it seems to me, ought to cover the catastrophic thing. The, the house painter who wrote to me recently and their 12-year-old daughter has kidney disease, and all of a sudden he's faced with $53,000 worth of hospital and medical bills. That, that family, shouldn't have to assume that by themselves. We ought to be doing that. I think if we did those two things, greater aid for those over 65, covering the catastrophic thing, I think this would be an immediate step and I think we could finance that. I do not personally go along with the uh, fully, and I haven't discussed this with Jerry and I don't know what Jerry's feeling is, but I don't go along fully with the Kennedy Corman approach. It seems to me that it goes a little further than we can handle it financially and maybe a little further than would be wise at this point. We must keep in mind that the federal government is there to do for the states what they can't do or won't do for themselves. And the states are there to do for the people what they can't or won't do for themselves. And catastrophic health insurance, the $200,000 bill that a, that a man suddenly finds himself faced with, losing his home, everything he has, is clearly an area where the government can help the man and he can't help himself. There's no question about it. And I think catastrophic insurance is what you're talking about, uh, is something that the federal government could do, should do, ought to do, and can do. And it costs less and does more for more people than any program I can think of. 
because there are not very many people in America that are going to be faced with a $50,000 bill. But all 214 million Americans uh, are going to bed tonight fearful that it might happen to them tomorrow. So this is legislation that would help all 215 million Americans because they would know it wouldn't happen to them. It'd give them peace of mind. And we would only have to provide the funding for those situations where it does indeed occur. And as far as the senior citizens uh, are, are involved, here again, it's helping those who cannot help themselves. And uh, I think we ought to be providing some kind of health care for senior citizens. They can't even get to a doctor in many rural communities. There's no transportation provided for them. In many cases, there's no doctors there. We have overlooked the health care for senior citizens. I can't buy the Kennedy bill. First place, it costs too much and we couldn't afford it. Second place, I suspect it goes farther than we, than we want it to go. I would like uh, a little discussion on the uh, status of the uh, estate tax reform and what you consider is the possibility of some new legislation in the near future. In 1942, the estate tax law was written that provided that upon the death of an individual, $60,000 of his estate would be tax-free. That exemption has not been changed in spite of the fact that inflation has devalued the, the value of that dollar to the point now that we'd have to have an exemption of $190,000 to be appropriate. And yet it hasn't been changed. Here's what happens. Farmer approaches 65 and he goes to his lawyer and he's assumed that he would be able to give his farm to his son, but he's advised by his lawyer that upon his death he can't give his farm to his son. The estate taxes would be so high on that farm, the son would be forced to sell off so much of the farm there wouldn't be enough left for it to be an economical unit. The same thing is applicable to a small businessman. Drug stores, grocery stores, shoe stores are being lost and eaten up by big chains because on the death of the owner of the store, the heirs cannot keep it. They have to give it up to Uncle Sam because the state taxes are high. They're high here, they're high in any country in the world, and they're high because governments like to tax those who complain the least, and dead people complain less than anybody. <laughs> that's just, just the way it is. Uh, we, that's isn't that right? Line. Isn't that right? All right. But, I'm going to steal that line from Jerry. <laughs> But let's take a, a woman who's worked alongside of her husband in that grocery store farm for 40 years. He dies. She can't even keep her store or her farm for the same reason. Well, let's take another example. A young man works with his father on the farm at age 20 or in the grocery store. At age 52, that business has increased in value substantially for the boy. Maybe the farm was worth $100,000 when he joined his father, maybe $500,000 when his father died at age 70. When Uncle Sam steps in and says that that $400 increased evaluation, it all belongs to your father, you contributed nothing to the increased evaluation, and we're gonna tax you for that $400,000 and make you pay again for what's yours. That's not fair, not at all. You and I know what the farmer should have done. He should have given part of that farm to his son every year over a period of 30 years, but he didn't because he was afraid if he did, he couldn't tell the boy when to milk. <laughs> so, he didn't. <laughs> but we lose the farm, and he loses the farm, and he's 52, and he can't do anything but farm when we take away what's his. So I, I have a bill of my own. The Burleson bill from Texas is another that will raise the exemption from 60000 to $200,000. My bill is also applicable to other areas of the estate tax legislation. The biggest hurdle we had was Mr. Ford was not for it. He came out against my bill in St. Louis. But an interesting thing happened to President Ford on the way to his reelection. He passed through Illinois. <laughs> <laughs> and two days before the primary in uh, Paul State, Mr. Ford had a change of heart, went down to the altar, dropped to his knees, confessed his sins, admitted he was wrong, and decided that maybe it ought to be changed. Originally, he'd said, no, let's not raise it up to 200,000. Let's just give the people 25 years to pay it off. You know, he, he didn't want to ease the pain. He just wanted to spread it out over a period of time. But he's changed his mind. And if he is as interested in correcting the mistake of not updating the estate tax law today as he was two days before the Illinois primary, then we'll get it passed. 
I might add one other factor that I would personally like to see on it, and that is a, uh, an escalation of uh, an inflationary factor. So that if, let's just say that we go to 200,000 today, if the cost of living goes up 4% this year, then that automatically goes up 4% so that we don't need to go through this thing again. But in fact, what we're doing the, is just the opposite of the intention of the inheritance tax. The inheritance tax not only was designed to raise revenue, it was designed to avoid the concentration of wealth. We're doing just exactly the opposite because we're moving now toward a uh, large corporate control of some of our farmland and many small businesses. That's right. Question here. Yes, I have a question to discuss with you. Uh, one, I'd like to know what your opinion is on the oil companies. What view you take there? In, in 30 seconds. <laughs> well, all right. First of all, I'd just like to know, you know, do you believe that the oil companies should be broken up? Do uh, you think that uh, that would be the right decision for our government to make? I realize and recognize there's a need for bigness in refining and finding the product and coming up with $10 billion to buy leased land or $50 million to refine it or to build a refinery. Uh, I understand the, the need for bigness and the fact that that will indeed hopefully create more of a product for us at a better price. <coughs> However, I see absolutely no good served with bigness and service stations at the corner. And I would suggest to the oil companies that they decide whether or not they want to find the product, refine the product, or whether or not they will sell it on the street corner. And I would not want to break them up, up and down the vertical integrated line, and force them to refine or find or what have you. But I would suggest to them that if they're going to do all of these other steps, that they leave the selling of the product up to somebody else. And I'll be introducing a piece of legislation to that extent. I find no good at all served by the big companies pumping gas on the corner. I've been fighting the big oil companies on this for a long time. They were closing service stations in, in this area during the energy crisis. The man works for 20 years. He gets up at midnight to take care of somebody's car, to pull somebody out of the ditch, to take care of their generator, take care of their car, or, or whatever it might be, because he wants their business. And uh, then the big oil company comes in and cancels their lease and takes away their store and takes away the business that they've, they've built up for 20 years. And I object to that. And what they replace it with is not a service station, but, but gas tanks. They don't want to put air in your tire, they want to put gas in your tank, and they're not interested in service at all. They're interested in moving the product. And back during the energy crisis, I really got ill when I saw all of these TV commercials. Here we are, the holier-than-thou holier oil companies. We're so great that we're buying television time to tell people not to buy as much gas. Aren't we marvelous folks? At the same time they were doing this, they were threatening my service station operators in my district that they didn't sell more gas per week, they were going to cancel their lease, and I object to that. And I think they either ought to find the product or sell it, but they ought to have to do both. Period. And if, if, if I may add on to what Jerry has said, the other, another thing concerns me, and that is the concentration not just of oil and gas, but of many energy resources in one corporate pot that, uh, well, I won't start naming the names, but that oil companies also control coal and control uranium and, you know, all along the line. I think this is not healthy. And I think that one of the reasons that, for example, we haven't had the development on uh, coal gasification is that the people who ought to be developing coal gasification have in fact had an economic incentive not to uh, develop coal gasification so that there ought to be some breakup. I recognize that in oil and natural gas there's a kind of a natural affinity and I'm not suggesting those two be broken up. But when you come to coal and uranium and some other things, solar energy and, and now they're talking about ocean energy, I think that can come from different corporate entities. Just as it would not be healthy for the same corporation to own the biggest airline and also to own a major part of the railroad. That's exactly right. Yes, but like, are you aware, for instance, uh, what it would cost the consumer to split this up? In other words, if you have to take, for instance, let's say Texaco, which is the largest marketer, it has the largest amount of you know, stations across the country. If you were to take its stations, its transportation unit away from it and make that a separate company, first of all, 
starting a new company, what happens, okay? That company would have to get up the capital in which to buy the equipment to do that. All right, they're going to tack that onto the price of gasoline. How would you feel if 10 or 12 farmers controlled all the, the majority of the wheat land in America, the bakers and the grocery stores that sold the bread? Oh, they'd have a lot of efficiency. They could use the same trucks everywhere, but they could also tell us what we were going to pay for our bread. I don't think we'd find the price of bread going down under those circumstances. I think it'd go up. Right. What's the possibility, is your thinking, of Congress getting more control of the Post Office Department after January the 1st, 1977? Well, I don't know that it's going to happen right on January 1, 1977, but I think there is a, an awareness that somehow we have to change this thing and there has to be greater executive control and congressional control. We discovered in the Chicago Bulk Mailing Center 3,700,000 packages that were undeliverable. And they said they hadn't found them until our committee came across them up there. Now, I, you know, I can believe that they might lose 500 packages but 3,700,000, I just can't believe that. You know, something's wrong with the management of that firm, let me tell you. When John F. Kennedy was president of the United States, we still had a three-cent first-class postage, and now we're up to 13, and they testified before our subcommittee the other day that by 1984, in order to balance the budget, they want a 34-cent first-class stamp. Now. <laughs> I, I say something's wrong, we gotta change this, and we better, we better halt those rate increases and improve the service. You know, the problem is, when we gave the post office into a separate corporation, we said, boy, we're in great shape. We're gonna turn it in and let it be operated like a business. The mistake we made was that, that it's being operated like the government would operate a business. <laughs> <laughs> Let's pick up one more. We've got about I'm two so minutes, I think, on our chart. probably gets your nerve up to get up here. I want to know how we can get our post office back like it was. I am not happy. I'm not satisfied. I'm not proud of them. I'm on what? James Ford, and I want to be on Gilman. I'm so mad I could just spit. <laughs> 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 what does she want to get back? Post office the way it was. Oh, oh. I want to know what we can post do. Post office the way it was. Yeah. <laughs> And I've just written to everybody. I've written to Baylor. I've written to Mr. Lurton twice. I've written to Jails twice. Yeah, but we don't get your mail. Why not? <laughs> 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 well, I, I really think what you ought to do is to write those congressmen who are on the Postal Committee. <laughs> <laughs> We have, we have run out of time, but I would like to say this, if Paul will be here very briefly as a plane to catch, I'll be here as long as anybody else is here. If you have any questions we haven't asked, why well, come on up, and uh, uh, if you're not in a big hurry for your question, wait till next month and, and ask it then, or write me and take your chances. <laughs> <laughs> Paul, it's great having you here, just I'm, great having you with us. It's great to be here and to see this pioneering effort that you have launched uh, here, Jerry, and I, I'd love to duplicate this in Southern Illinois, but I'm not as good a salesman as Jerry Whitten <laughs> is. <laughs> <laughs> we appreciate everybody coming today, and, and we hope that you can be with us next month. Uh, uh, there's no admission to these meetings, just come through the door if you'd like, and if you can't be with us in person, we hope that you can. Uh, we hope that you uh, follow us on the more than 30 radio and television stations around the Middle West that, that carry the program. So we'd like to ask you to join us next month as we again bring government back to the people. Thank you, Jerry. Very good. Yeah, I enjoyed it. Very, very good. You've been watching Dialogue with Lytton, now in its fourth year of taking government to the people. Congressman Jerry Lytton believes that government should be more open and accessible to the people, that people should have more say in their government. That's what Dialogue with Lytton is all about. Be sure to continue to watch it on this station.